Thank you. And if the other panelists could please come up and join me up here on the stage. You, you can sit in any order you like. Good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first panel this afternoon on a rules-based order in outer space. One of the common themes of discussion on outer space governance these days is ensuring space sustainability through a rules-based order in outer space. And of course, this raises questions. Uh, what, what do we mean by a rules-based order? Is there a common understanding of what this concept means? Um, is space a fundamentally different domain of human activities with implications for the rule of law and governance? Um, or is space a kind of a wild west, as some suggest? How do we reconcile the different visions for space exploration to arrive at a rules-based order in space? And what are some of the potential friction points? How do we encourage both enforcement of existing international space uh, regulations, and the further development of new mechanisms and institutions to cover the future of space activity. So see, these are some of the themes that we will be exploring in this panel. And to discuss these topics today, we have uh, 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 eminent uh, panelists uh, up here on the stage with me. Um, so in, uh, not, not in, well, I guess it is kind of an order of, uh, you, you've actually seated in exactly the same order as my notes. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. So starting with uh, over at the, the my, my far right, Nicholas Hedman, the current acting director of UN USA. Then next to him, uh, Beza Unal, the head of science, technology, and international security at the UN Office for Disarmament Affairs. Then next up is, um, Rajiv Suri, CEO of Inmarsat. Then Andrew Ratcliffe, uh, Chief Engineer at the UK Space Agency. And on my immediate right, Jenny Tapio. Um, she's the head of the Space Office in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment of Finland. So thank you all for taking the time to share your expertise and views with us. So as with the other uh, panels in this conference, we will go straight into a panel discussion. And just to remind you that you can address questions to the panelists through the Hoover app. So starting with you, Nicholas, uh, during the 1960s, the, the UN and, um, and eventually UN Corpus was a hotbed of discussion on international law that led to the creation of the Outer Space Treaty and the other um, three treaties that followed. But in the intervening years, the focus has shifted away from legally binding, uh, the development of legally binding mechanisms to more voluntary norms. What do you think happened to bring that change about? And do you see this as an impediment to the progressive development and codification of space law? Thank you, Peter, and thank you for inviting me to this important panel. Um, I used to say that in Corpus, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which is really the global level of the peaceful civilian space cooperation, uh, now comprising 100 states members with all the major spacefaring nations being involved. And there are four phases of governance. So as you said correctly, it started in 1960. In 20 years, the five United Nations treaties on outer space were formed by this intergovernmental body. After that came a period of another 20 years from 1980 to 2000, where this body developed a set of principles for such set of principles, which were filling out certain areas that were already enshrined in the general principles laid down in the legally binding instruments. And after that period, another 20 year mark with really looking into how states are implementing their rights and obligations under the treaties, under the legally binding instruments. So we looked into registration practice, national space legislation, the notion or concept of 
what does launching state mean in reality? The space debris mitigation guidelines, the safety framework for nuclear power sources, and 2019, the long-term sustainability guidelines. <coughs> so that also fulfills that period. Now, 2021, another 20-year period, what next? What will we see? I think that your question is interesting because uh, the whole notion of legally binding, non-legally binding instruments, it, it's not only that there is no consensus among the major actors to achieve a treaty-bound regime, uh, it's also, it's not only in itself, it's do we need legally binding instruments? Do we need new treaties? Maybe not. It's also the period of 1950 to 1980, it was more of a, a treaty-making era across the board in not only space affairs, but in other areas also. And after that, as we have seen, gradually an era where there is more my looking into voluntary, non-legally binding instruments. So there are various factors there. I would say, as just to conclude this uh, introductory remarks, that I see this as part of the progressive development of international law. Uh, we might debate what constitutes uh, international law and where do the non-legally binding instruments such as guidelines fit into the overall legally binding regime. But I see this as part of the progressive development. The impediment is to the codification of international law because that would not lead to a codification of rules of international law that are legally binding. So I would separate those two concepts. Thank you, Nicholas. So then, kind of continuing along this theme then, um, Jenny, the, the rules framework for space includes not just the specific treaties, but also um, a broader body of international law. Can you explain to us why that is the case and what other categories of international law might apply to space activities? Thank you for, for that question. And again, also from my side, thank you for, for the invitation and, and for the organization of this in-person meeting here uh, in, in London. So it's a pleasure to be here and, and, and speak to everyone here in, in person. Um, I think uh, some of the, the, the elements were already well outlined uh, by, by Nicholas there, just to, to really to outline that the governance of space activities really um, consists of diverse elements and as well, well, let's say tools, as it was mentioned by, by the previous speaker. So including the international legal framework, the space treaties, but also the understanding that international law applies to, to space activities. But then also this international um, non-legally binding instruments, soft law instruments, not only those made in, in the uh, Committee on, on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space or within the United Nations, but also by different technical uh, standardization bodies and uh, as well uh, uh, political understandings made outside uh, the, the, the scope of the United Nations, coupled with uh, the, the rise of, of national laws. And of course, these two, the, the last elements, they, they, they come together because of, of the uh, private activities uh, and, and the requirement to, to uh, continuously supervise and license those activities, they come uh, hand in hand. And of course, for the legal framework, it is in, uh, in interesting and uh, uh, very understandable development that alongside those non-legally binding instruments, we need uh, national space laws to actually to implement those non-legally binding instruments to, to be binding at national level. But then just to come uh, to, to some of those challenges that might, might come with, uh, with that development, um, of course, there, there are the, the issue of fragmentation of, of international uh, framework once we, we start to develop uh, through those non-legally binding instruments and, and, and through national um, laws. So perhaps I just stop the, the introductory remarks here and, and Let's continue the discussion. Yeah, yeah that, that is a point I intend to come back to later, this uh, issue of fragmentation. Um, and also you, you made the, interest, uh, the important point that um, non-binding does not mean non-legal in the sense that these non-binding uh, agreements that um, are reached in places like Corpus are in a sense politically binding, but they can be given legal character by being implemented in their national regulatory frameworks. And we have to, to enforce that or, or to, to um, promote that. 
So then perhaps moving on to the, uh, the commercial perspective, um, uh, and I'd like to address this question to Rajiv. Um, how, how do you see this topic of rules-based order in space, and can you describe how the current order impacts commercial space operators, and do you see a level playing field for commercial actors uh, operating across different jurisdictions? Thanks, Peter. I think that's a critical question if we are to keep space as a productive asset for generations to come. So I think this notion of rules-based order in space frankly does not exist and hence, you know, hence the, uh, the idea of Wild West because let's call a spade a spade. There are massive launches to come. There are you know, some 100,000 uh, LEO satellites that are probably going to be in place based on active projects by 2030 and maybe that's underestimated, right, because the filings are actually much more than that, hundreds of thousands. And um, I think it was ESA that said that we're not ready, our current behavior in space is unsustainable. And so we see three broad challenges. There's the space debris challenge. Uh, there's uh, the challenge on the environment because with you know, decaying uh, and uh, deorbiting satellites, uh, it's clear that there will be uh, so much alumina deposited in the Earth's upper atmosphere that creates a climate change problem here on Earth. And that's why we say you know, net zero in space is required for net zero on Earth. And then there's the orbital congestion uh, problem, which is that you know, in a particular orbital shell, there are just too many satellites, so the risk of collision is that much higher with the addition of you know, every, every satellite. Uh, but related to that, there is the orbital exclusion problem, which is the monopoly formation in that uh, orbit, so that you know, one company or one state actor can monopolize you know, a, a particular orbit. Both are problems. So if I think of uh, the five requirements we need to have to underpin a solution, I think one is whatever solution there's got to be has got to be global, global with a level playing field for the industry. Uh, there's got to be both monitoring and enforcing capability. Like, you know, Yeni said that, you know, you, you have this rules-based order, it's non-binding, but these voluntary things don't work. So I think you eventually have to have both monitoring and enforcement. And it's got to be based on you know, deep science and technology, but also an investment in, in, in tools, interoperable standards, um, you know, ASA, active debris removal, you name it. Uh, and we have to separate the issues of sustainability and, uh, and national security. And then finally, it's got to be fast. You know, any day we would go for an imperfect solution you know, rather than seek perfection for, for years and years and, and, and decades to come. So in, in that context, we have issued, as in Marsat, a report today that calls for some serious recommendations. And the summary recommendations are that, uh, number one, uh, national, so that can be the fastest action. When you give market access uh, nationally, you only give so based on sustainable behavior, a, a plan for debris removal, you know, a plan for sustainability, and if you're going to have, you know, I don't know, two to four percent satellite failure, you need to be able to have a plan to address that. Uh, second, multilateral, uh, key countries agree basic standards, forward-looking uh, countries based on good satellite programs, the UK, uh, countries in the, in the UA, uh, EU, US, you know, Brazil, Australia, et cetera, can come together to agree on some basic standards, uh, principles, uh, and even tools. And then finally, global. So we're calling for a, an extended mandate for ITU, which today basically has a mandate for you know, spectrum interference, but, but not really a mandate for space sustainability. So we're calling for an extended mandate and resources for them to be able to address space sustainability. And finally, I mean, we've got to act now uh, because every year there are going to be thousands of new LEO satellites being added into the Earth's upper atmosphere. Thank you. Yeah, so this idea that the existing framework um, needs to be further developed, I'd like to sort of just pursue that, um, uh, that line uh, a little bit further and address the following question to Andrew. So one of the areas where the existing order is underdeveloped is on how to manage these new commercial activities um, involving close proximity operations such as satellite servicing, refueling and so on. And um, I'm aware that the UK has been working on this issue. Can you tell us a bit about how you're approaching developing a national framework uh, for servicing and these other new kinds of commercial uh, close proximity operations. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. So, um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Peter mentioned, my name is Andrew Ratcliffe. I'm Chief Engineer at the UK Space Agency. 
Um, so to provide a bit of context, um, so within the agency, we have uh, the Office of the Chief Engineers. So it's a group of engineers and scientists which essentially support across the agency um, from implementing our large projects, working through to sort of the policy elements. And that's critically important because in a lot of these policy discussions, we need to ensure that they're evidence-based, that they're building on an innate understanding of what the operators are intending to do, um, and that, that they're based on research and, and proven evidence. So within the UK framework, um, within July um, 21, uh, the uh, space flight regulator within the UK moved to the CAA, so our Civil Aviation Authority. Um, and that was really to create a uh, clear blue water between our funding body, so the agency, um, as those working with industry directly, and then our regulator, which is dealing with more of the safety um, elements and the sustainability um, elements. So within that, the, the CAA, um, the Space Flight Regulator, is responsible for licensing our launch and our, our orbital activities. And that really works to, um, obviously, Article 6 within the Outer Space Treaty, where we're, where we're required to authorise and supervise um, our national activities. Um, you look, last year, we also um, released our space industry regulations. So this was a, a flexible, outcome-based um, approach to national regulation. So rather than being prescriptive, we worked towards more of an objective-based um, uh, framework. But even before that um, uh, came, um, we had we licensed two uh, technology demonstrators on ADR. So the first one was Remove Debris. Um, so this was a mission led by um, a, a academic consortium from um, Surrey Space Centre uh, with a number of partners across Europe, um, including Airbus and, and others. And that tested a number of novel technologies from, from nets to harpoons to um, visual-based um, navigation technologies. And we did that by engaging with the operator as, a, as the regulator, by engaging with them to try and understand the risk um, and provide that um, um, education on, on what, where we saw the risk um, um, manifesting. And then within that framework, we also licensed um, ELSA-D, uh, which is an astroscale mission, um, which again was demonstrating um, technology for um, um, ADR. And that was really trying to leverage um, international um, best practice. Um, so we looked towards the international community to understand uh, what, um, what good looks like. So uh, looking towards ESA and the, um, their uh, guidelines on um, CPO, the um, close proximity operations. Um, and others confers um, through their um, best practice, their guidelines um, on operation. So moving forward, um, the UK is um, looking to develop a more comprehensive uh, framework um, for uh, in-orbit servicing and manufacturing missions and ADR. Um, and that's some of the work that's um, being led within the agency um, at the moment and working with uh, the regulator. And I have some of my policy colleagues um, here today. But there's obviously a number of challenges um, around developing that framework from, from export issues around uh, data exchange uh, between companies, around liability sharing between um, the um, uh, various organizations involved. Um, so there are elements that we're working through and it's um, the teams are working in concert with industry and other regulators to try and um, develop a more comprehensive framework to um, regulate submissions in the future. Thank you. That's all very interesting. And one of the points that um, uh, arises up in, in these sorts of discussions is the, um, the degree of separation that one wants to have between regulation and promotion and implementation, <coughs> whether, whether those functions should be separated perhaps even within dif to, to different ministries or under the same ministry, and we might perhaps come back to this point and hear your, your thoughts on this. Um, going back to one of the points that uh, Rajiv made in his, um, in his remarks, uh, you, you, you touched on um, uh, the security aspect, and um, we have on our panel um, Beza Unal from the UN Office of Disarmament Affairs. So, Beza, could you explain what UNODA is, uh, is to this audience and um, discuss what it's doing to promote a rules-based order in outer space? Sure. Um, thank you very much, Peter. So UNODA is responsible uh, from supporting member states on uh, their multilateral negotiations, uh, mainly on outer space affairs. Um, our mandate comes from the United Nations resolutions, generally from the uh, General Assembly or disarmament-related uh, affairs. And um, from where Nikla sits in the UN USA and where we sit, uh, I generally get the question of like, so what is the difference between these two bodies? 
Um, Niklas, as he mentioned, he focuses and his team focuses on the peaceful uses of outer space and the sustainability side of the efforts. Um, at UNODA, uh, we focus on the dark side of the uh, matters, which is the security side, uh, I, I would say. So that is really the clear difference between where we are. And uh, we generally uh, support each other and work uh, together uh, to deliver the Secretary General's agenda on, uh, on um, peaceful uses of outer space. Uh, so there is convergence between uh, Niklas's work and, and uh, our work. And um, the second part of the question was uh, promoting rules-based order, I believe, uh, uh, Peter. So what do we do to promote rules-based order? Um, there are a few uh, activities that are taking place in the multilateral fora at the moment on the security side. Um, the conference on disarmament in Geneva uh, is uh, leading on the... Um, the, the frameworks that are legally binding uh, measures and instruments uh, that would be for uh, preventing arms race in outer space, which is known as PAROS. Um, it has got into some uh, clashes, unfortunately, in recent years and for many years maybe. That, the, because of those clashes, what we had seen is a new UN General Assembly resolution in 2021 that was actually spearheaded by the United Kingdom. Um, on focusing on, uh, on an open-ended working group discussion um, with regards to space threats uh, through norms, rules, and, and principles uh, of responsible behaviors. <coughs> so in one, on one hand, we're seeing this, uh, you know, the, the, the legal instruments and how to get that on board. On the other hand, we're seeing some countries pushing for the voluntary norms uh, stand. So it's the same in the security side of the things. Um, going back to, I think, your question to Nicholas, I think it's important. We need to see these processes complementary to each other rather than uh, competing with each other. And, and, and probably if we, if we kind of square that out and that create that uh, complementary aspect, that would be really uh, helpful, I would say. Um, and of course, there's always this agreement going forward between our different uh, countries on, on the security side of the things as well. So finding nuances and approaches would always, uh, I think, be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we're aware of this sort of uh, recent development around developing uh, or discussing norms, principles, and so on of responsible behavior under the the first committee, right, it deals with the disarmament yeah. aspects. But going back to, to the fourth committee bodies in Corpus, uh, Nicholas, where does this issue stand today in Corpus? Do you see a push for stronger rules-based order in space, or is it more a case of more, um, a better, or stronger implementation of the already existing instruments, be they binding or voluntary? Well, <clears throat> it's, um, it's quite a complicated question because it's, it's not that easy to say that uh, either we want a rules-based order, meaning new legally binding instruments, or perfecting the already adopted instruments by, by amendments. Contra, we don't want new legally binding instruments, we only want guidelines. No, I, I think it's a symbiosis there. And uh, there are, of course, in an intergovernmental body of 100 states member with all the major spacefaring nations and quite many emerging space nations that are now, for the first time, developing capabilities in launching and deploying small satellites in orbit, mm -hmm. for which they would be responsible under Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty and potentially held liable for damage caused to other space objects, etc. So it's serious for all states, government, and of course then they have the responsibility to implement those obligations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, their, their actors under their jurisdiction. So I would say no, there is no, no push for a more robust uh, rules-based order. We have already a rules-based order because we have five treaties four sets of principles or five sets of principles and a range of supporting instruments that are supporting the implementation of the legally binding uh, provisions. So we have a rules-based order. The, the important factor here is now 
and I would like to relate to what Jenny said, that it's also a matter of how states are implementing their obligations and how they are taking this seriously in their national regulatory frameworks. So that is where we really have an important factor here, how states are implementing those obligations. And that, I think, is something that we will see more and more of, and where states, which already have uh, implemented, they have a robust national regulatory system, uh, where they can serve as uh, um, advocates, if <laughs> in a way, for a, a good way of implementing those, uh, those obligations, particularly in the long-term sustainability area, uh, implementing the, the guidelines, Peter, and the sustainability area. And there I need, I think we need uh, far more interaction among all the states, members of the committee, because that is the global, ultimate global level in the peaceful uses of outer space. I'm only addressing now civilian space activities and cooperation. Yeah, and this is where, for example, the sharing of implementation experiences yeah. is so important, and I think where the UK um, is one of the countries that has prepared very useful documents that, um, uh, that other countries can look at as a sort of a uh, helpful sharing of implementation experience. Uh, may I just, just to say, yeah. yes, and to share implementation experience, and then what is very important is also how to transform this information into capacity building, mm -hmm. training, and awareness increasing. And just to, to very quickly note that my office, Office for Outer Space Affairs, we work very closely with the UK Space Agency in trying to, to spread the words how important it is to implement those guidelines, the long-term sustainability guidelines, and try to, to make a, 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 an awareness increasing campaign in this regard. So I think that is a small step, but it is an effort to, to lead into a much stronger implementation among all actors. And I'm talking not only of about major space faring nations, but also emerging space nations. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's such an important work that the office is doing because, as, as you well know, the LTS guidelines are not prescriptive uh, about their manner of implementation because, you know, negotiating them, we recognize the, the great diversity of um, ways in which countries uh, plan um, uh, and execute space activities and govern their space activities. So the guidelines aren't prescriptive to allow that flexibility for implementation, but then it does raise questions. And so that's why this capacity building is, is so important. Um, then if I could um, come back to a, a point that you had made earlier, Jenny. Um, so as, as um, Nicholas mentioned, um, there's been a sort of a lack of appetite to negotiate new legally binding instruments um, in, in recent years and, and the, a push to developing non-binding instruments um, that seek to clarify the application of the existing treaties to new situations and contexts. And as we know, there are a number of soft law initiatives that purport to support or clarify the existing treaties in one way or another. And so my question is, could this proliferation of non-binding initiatives have unintended consequences of undermining or diluting the existing binding obligations contained in the treaties? Thank you for that question, which I have to say is not an easy one, but just to tap on something about uh, what Nicholas was saying, just to first start from, from this, that we, yes, we do have a, a rule-based uh, international order starting from the Outer Space Treaty and, and, and the subsequent treaties, which are still relevant and applicable and, and, and provide for the, the, for the foundation uh, on, on which then we can base on these other elements and other tools uh, for, for the regulation of space activities coming then together to, to this toolbox, if you will. Um, and of course, this is something that, that, that is quite natural because of the development of the activity. So the regulation has to de develop uh, alongside, but, but really uh, we need to think about uh, where and, and by whom uh, should that uh, regulation uh, uh, be made. Um, I just don't also want to forget the, the, the possibility of a, a binding treaty uh, at, at, at some point so that we, we don't forget about this possibility while we, we do uh, work on with these non-legally binding instruments and, and, and those are currently the best tools of regulation that we have together with, uh, with the national space laws. But exactly this, uh, the issue of implementation and effect effective implementation and the way how to 
implement in a way that doesn't fragment the, the, the international regulation of, of space activities really requires this symbiosis a bit that it, it's not a question either or, but really how to, how to make the, um, the, the system interoperable uh, together with those, uh, uh, let's say, legally binding and those less legally binding, more politically binding, but, but eventually then through national law also binding at, at the national level. And then, of course, navigating that is, is not uh, un un uncomplicated. So, and, and it provides for, for legal effects that, that we have to think about when elements which are put together are not designed necessarily to, to live in, the, in this um, uh, symbiosis. So just to, to look into some of the uh, opportunities, of course, you already mentioned also that the flexibility uh, comes uh, with, with having that sort of governance uh, framework. And of course, it, it responds to the needs of now and, and, and really answers to, to the technical uh, problems that, that we are currently facing. But of course, this uh, flexibility comes with, uh, with the challenge of, of certainty. We heard uh, many times earlier today that, that the, the legal certainty is something that uh, the, all the actors actually need, be that, that at international level or, or national level. So, so how, to, how to transfer that need into, into this um, framework. So, so really just to uh, look into to who, who are making those non-legally binding instruments, because that is not a, a homogeneous group. I mean, we refer to them as non-legally binding instruments, soft law, but it actually includes various different types of, of, of guideline standards and, and, and best practices. And, and so who are making those and who are participating in, in, in making those? And, and whose values do they represent? So are they capable of, for example, um, responding to those values that are set out in the, in the international framework, so in the Outer Space Treaty, for example, and, and are they reflective of the public values that, that those treaties uh, uh, represent, uh, for example, the, including the, the, the notion of responsibility, which can be interpreted to, to include sustainability and, and safety and cooperation. Um, so just to really to underline as well that, yes, it's not a uniform group. It, it, they are not all the same. And um, uh, even sometimes we refer to these, especially in relation to space debris mitigation, these internationally recognized standards and guidelines. And these are actually very different if you, if you look into the details. So, so the devil is in, in details in, in, in that respect as well. Um, and then just to perhaps just quickly, uh, uh, just to mention, because standardization has been a topic that we've been discussing today. So of course, for example, in relation to the International Standardization Organization, that is not an international intergovernmental organization where states take the floor similarly as, as in COPO. So consensus building there is not exactly uh, the same as it's among the 100 member states uh, within COPO. Thanks. Thank you. So, Rajiv, I want to go back to a point you made earlier during your, your last intervention where you, you pointed out to the, um, the need for some, some more clarity, regulatory clarity. So do you think that there's a, a need for more rules and treaties in space, or is it the case that we need to develop a better understanding uh, and application of what we already have in place, or is it a combination? Yeah, I think, Peter, I think the rules are alone are not enough. You know, we need enforcement. So that's the, that's the difference. Uh, we don't even understand all of the risks. Uh, we don't understand all of the impact. Uh, we need to act now before, before we regret. Prevention is better than cure. Uh, and we can't wait because there is an explosion uh, in new satellites and we're talking about mega constellations and they're all well funded, many of them. The active projects are well funded by companies that can afford it, can take the economic risk in. You know, some of them don't have a desire for near-term profit, uh, or China's 13,000, you know, mega constellation, or Rwanda's idea of 300,000 uh, constellations, so, or, or the billionaires that are, uh, you know, taking the economic risk. So they will most likely happen, is the point. So I think we can't wait for global treaties, um, and so as I said before, there needs to be national action. Uh, you know, when you provide market access, there needs to be multilateral action with the you know, countries that sort of uh, advanced space nations that get this, uh, followed by global, and then somebody needs to have some teeth. Uh, and, and we're recommending that, you know, maybe ITU is the one that needs to expand its mandate. So, so no, rules aren't enough, I think, need enforcement. Okay. Um, maybe just, just to add, so 
I'd, I would say this is where um, groups such as the IADC, so the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, is, is so important because there are 13 space agencies um, all doing active research within in space debris and come together to, to do this fundamental research which should underpin anything we put forward in terms of guidelines because we need to understand, as we were saying earlier, about the unintended consequences. Right. If we adopt these rules and these guidelines and we don't know what their long-term impact is, right. we could be making the situation worse. Right. And so this is where, within that framework of, of developing guidelines, um, that's where uh, organisations yeah. such as IADC are so important. Makes sense. Thank yeah. you. Just picking up on this, uh, on this point that Rajiv just made about the importance of monitoring and, uh, and enforcement. So, um, you, you know, this, this obviously the, the monitoring uh, capability is, is key to, to all of this. Um, and so, Andrew, how well do you think we do that currently? Um, and w what needs to be improved? Yes, thanks, Peter. Um, so, so within the UK, um, so within the UK Space Agency, we have uh, a team of orbital analysts. They work very closely um, with um, our MOB partners. Um, so they're based um, at the UK Space Operations Centre and they perform a range of um, services. So they look at um, collision avoidance, uh, fragmentation and also re-entry events. And this is something that's provided um, commercially but then also uh, within um, government. Uh, in terms of the data that they use, it's both, um, we're looking towards um, sort of commercial provision, um, so partnering with um, um, organizations such as Numerica and uh, Leo Labs, um, and also that's used to supplement um, information that we get from um, US, the space track, and then also through uh, government sensors. Um, but moving forward, um, obviously there's, there's um, challenges in terms of this, uh, in terms of our uh, capability to monitor, obviously in terms of the environment itself, um, there's obviously a large uh, number of objects that are untrackable, um, so we have a catalogue of objects that we know about, and obviously we can perform um, preventative operations to uh, manoeuvres to try and avoid those objects. Um, but then as we, as we move forward, there's also um, increased complexity of, of missions. Um, so there's um, obviously an increase in the number of rideshare missions. Um, so launch vehicles that are going to deploy a large number of objects uh, on orbit and to catalogue those objects uh, soon after deployment is very uh, complex. And as we see um, more flexible upper stages being launched um, to deploy uh, small payloads, um, we need to develop the tools and the capabilities to really um, catalogue and identify those objects um, sooner. Um, and then also uh, with the growth of population on orbit, there's uh, issues around uh, launch collision avoidance. Um, so at the moment we screen um, our launches um, within the launch window to, to ensure that when we do launch our, the launch vehicles that they're um, going to avoid uh, any objects um, on orbit. So as, obviously as the population increases, um, those challenges um, increase. So there's a need to uh, improve our um, capability to monitor the, monitor the environment um, and act upon that um, information. But I think importantly, though, that um, the monitoring element, so the prevention, is only one part of the puzzle. So the, the prevention needs to act alongside the mitigation. So you need to ensure your platforms are designed um, to avoid fragmentation, so that they perform end-of-life manoeuvres, that they have collision avoidance, so they can perform um, uh, those manoeuvres. And then also we have the capabilities on, on remediation, um, that we have the capabilities to remove objects. And only through the three of those elements can we really work towards a sustainable environment and we can use that toolbox, that, that um, ability to try and uh, improve the environment. Thank you. So now, now perhaps looking at some other domains, um, you know, one, one sometimes hear parallels being drawn between space and the cyber domains. And um, uh, Beza, I know that you're, you're an expert in the, um, uh, the um, governance of, of, of cyber um, issues. So building on that background, what, what are some of the lessons uh, to be learned or paths to be avoided um, from how the cyber community has worked on creating a rules-based order? Are there any lessons we can take from that community? Thanks, Peter. So on the cyber side, things are moving a little faster probably than, than, than it's going in the outer space side of the things. Uh, but there are still challenges in the ICT domain as well. Um, but I, I would say probably one of the lessons learned from the cyber community, I think, is that um, 
the community kind of like did not let let the differences, the political differences, casting shadow on on the potential to reach consensus at the international fora. And I think that that, that is quite important. Um, there, there were around six uh, group of governmental experts uh, meetings on on, on uh, ICT security, um, and on I think in 2015 they came up with an agreement of voluntary non-binding norms. Um, and I think that's critical for the cyber community, but also it creates hopes for the outer space community as well. Um, during the, that negotiations, an area that the, uh, in the cyberspace that they couldn't agree on was um, how to address uh, in international humanitarian law, IHL. Um, and, and that was kind of like a, you know, bottleneck point uh, and, and whether to create a consensus report or not, so that decision was coming on. And at, at the end, uh, they decided to use the principles within, within the report, so they referred to proportionality, distinction, humanity, and so on, without directly referencing, without re directly stating IHL itself, but they just framed it under legal principles. So that kind of created all, com all states to come together and agree that that could go forward, and which then led to that 11 uh, voluntary norms to be, uh, to be addressed. So we need to, I think, take that as a, as a lesson learned for the outer space community as well. There, there, there will be no way of reaching a perfect agreement among, among state parties. So states should be uh, willing to give concession uh, in, in, in some regard when it comes. I think the second lessons learned probably on this is that when this cyber community agreed on the 11 norms, they stated that um, these norms should be just the baseline and, and the states should continue to actually upgrade these and add more norms as it comes. So when, when we have the discussion in the outer space side, uh, when states say, oh, you know, but which, which norm should be the priority? Which principle should be the priority? Well, you know, we should be focusing on the ones that we can agree at this point and then, and then come up in the long run of more norms and, and principles. Um, I think the, the United States' uh, moratorium on, on uh, banning uh, ASAT tests, for instance, um, uh, missile tests is, is a good way of thinking about those, those norms in the long run uh, to be coming forward. Canada also followed suit. I, I hope that other countries would join that, uh, that call. Um, and also, I think the third lesson learned for us is that multi-stakeholder approach is really key. And on the cyber side, we had seen private sector really pushing forward on, on creating those principles, working with the governments. Um, uh, I don't need to, I think, name these uh, private sector uh, entities, but like they're really well known. So we, we need that push from the private sector as well in the outer space, really to take the, 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 the lead and, and work with the governments. Um, and, and that would be really helpful. Um, an area probably to avoid um, is to create dual track approaches. Uh, there was a point, I think, in the cyber discussions where we had seen both a GG group of governmental experts and, the, uh, and an open-ended working group working on the same kind of subject. It kind of dilutes uh, the, the capacity, the capability, the resources that many states have. Not, not everyone is, you know, not every country has the same level of capability and capacity. So we need to understand that working on one area would be probably um, achievable uh, in the long run. And of course, there are links with, you know, technical links, there's supply chain security, uh, security by design concepts that's mentioned, you know, like preventing collusion risks and so on, maturity models. So all of those are really linked between each other, between uh, space and, and the cyber field. Thank you, Beza. So we've uh, had a, uh, quite a few very interesting questions uh, submitted by the audience, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to try and uh, address as many as I can in the time available, and I, I may combine some of them um, that are sort of along similar lines. So um, one of the questions is, how do we get out of this, um, the situation of uh, everyone must agree um, before moving forward? Um, uh, isn't, um, isn't this uh, keeping us back from reaching um, agreement? Since we agree it's, it's urgent to 
uh, address uh, some of these issues uh, from a, a regulatory or, or operational or other perspectives. Um, so there's that, and related to that is um, how do we ensure that the geopolitics on the ground doesn't affect the safety and sustainability of operations in space? Anyone would like to have a go at that? Jenny. Uh, yes, so if I can just uh, at, at least address uh, some of those uh, points there. Um, everyone has to agree it has its certain um, uh, advantages. I mean, especially uh, when, when in, in COPOS, when we talk about among the 100 member states, if we can reach consensus, which takes long, which you, you know very well, uh, but this consensus is important when we come into this effective implementation phase. So once we, now we st have to start to implement all these non-legally binding instruments at national level, having reached that consensus, having agreed with everyone uh, on, on what is to be implemented, is, is actually quite strong uh, tool. We just have to make uh, sure that we've understood uh, the, the guidelines in the same way, and this comes also through then uh, what was mentioned earlier as well, this reporting that some states have already started so that we, we can, in a way, verify and monitor that, that we've understood them in the same way. But here, agreeing uh, together is actually quite strong. Nicholas? Yeah. An example on <clears throat> how to move forward, um, you know, if I say, say so, on the implementation or the, the, the future development on the long-term sustainability of outer space activities, at least in the Coopers context. So four, four pillars, four bullets. Starts with capacity building and awareness, and we have started that already, um, but it's not enough. Uh, there is really a need for an increased dialogue between governments, uh, regulators, and private sector entities under their jurisdiction. Th that, is, that must happen. And it's not only in the major space nations, but all around the world. Because also in emerging space nations, that is really also a push for a stronger space economy that would support uh, a, a um, I would say, societal growth. So that, is, that dialogue is essential. At the intergovernmental level, at the global level, which means COOPUS, um, we need a more structured reporting on how we implement the guidelines. So those states that can share, it's not enough that they just do it. It must, must be organized and structured in a way so that we can relate to the various elements and factors in, in, in helping other states to benefit from, from that knowledge. And lastly, we need, and I would say, sooner than later, we need a structured information exchange at that intergovernmental level on space objects and events. And, and that was one of the real concerns behind the LTS guidelines on avoiding collisions, uh, avoiding uh, orbital breakups, uncontrolled reentries, and all of that, space objects and events, but we need it structured. If we do this, and if we manage it well at the global level, we will see emerging or embryos for space traffic coordination, whether we're talking about a top-down approach regime at the international level or a bottom-up uh, space traffic management understanding. We will see elements that will fit closer into STM if we do that. Thank you. So this is a, another question that um, has been um, touched on by a number of the um, the, the participants, uh, is that uh, how do we avoid a situation, we talk about rules-based order, right? So who, who gets to make the rules? How do we avoid a situation where this, the rules are made um, or imposed unilaterally by certain nations or, or groups of like-minded nations? Should I yep. start, Peter? Um, I mean, I think the best way to avoid that situation is, is really to, to to channel the efforts at the multilateral level uh, and incorporate countries that may not have the same capability or the capacity that the like-minded nation, nations have. Um, we are seeing different groups it, on the security side. We are seeing different groups coming together um, and, you know, from different geographies, I would say. Um, and they do not necessarily agree with each other. Um, I mean, uh, you would see country, some countries asking for um, 
no first placement of weapons uh, in outer space, uh, whereas some other countries indicate that what is a weapon we do not know, so we can't actually agree on that and go forward with that. We would like to go with the norms approach. The, the good thing that's happening that I, I am actually observing is that these states talk with each other. They do not, you know, they come to the table Yes, with their own interests and everything, but they, they still put their ideas forward and they, they do not shut down. And, and that's the key point. We need to, at the end, come up with a common understanding. Mm. And the good point, another point on this, is that um, countries that currently do not have the same capacity and capability are also speaking up and they're, they're indicating that they also have a stake on, on, on this and they should be involved in the discussions. And that's really key, I think, especially for developing countries or less developed countries to be, uh, to be on the same side. And, and Nicholas's point on capacity building is really key in outer space on the security side of the issues as well. Uh, because what we're seeing is that if countries are not involved in the negotiations at the earlier stage, then when it comes to the later stage, they just find themselves being embedded into something that they have not been you know, brought in from the beginning, and that's never helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, I think that you the bottom line is that we need better regulation uh, of LEO to address orbital congestion, physical collision risk, and orbital exclusion, economic monopoly formation risk. Uh, we need that. And it is not difficult for national regulators to take position on, on, well, if I'm going to give market access, if you're going to give market access, then we would like to see a sustainability plan, right? However we define that in the end. And then it doesn't have to be at this multi-stakeholder level. It doesn't have to be like-minded countries. That's a start. It can be sort of greater than that. but. The reality is that time is of the essence, so it just cannot carry on for years and years. And third, let's give somebody a mandate. And ITU seems like one. Uh, maybe it's not perfect, but you know it's done a fairly good job of uh, spectrum interference management and so on. And it is the ICT body, so that could be one with an expanded mandate. Uh, but we need regulation, right? Uh, we, we just it cannot be that we've grown from you know 1,400 satellites in uh, 2014 to about 5,000 satellites. Now we're going to go to 100,000, and, and then we're going to keep debating this without much action. So we have to stop being a talking shop at some point and, and make stuff happen. Mm -hmm. so, so just following on this, I mean, if we all agree on regulations, rules of behavior. Uh, and as we all know, currently, there is no international space police, right, to enforce the rules that we agree on. So um, uh, is it? Um, uh, how, how can we um, uh, encourage uh, compliance? What, what is the role of um, multilateral bodies in, in, in encouraging compliance? To, to what extent um, is it necessary to be able to demonstrate that the rules that we all agree on are being followed? I mean, I'll take that first. So I think, um, just following on from what Nicholas said <coughs> earlier, so within the um, LTS um, guidelines, when in 21 agreed that, that Part A is on uh, national frameworks. Um, so within some of the activities within the UK, we've looked at, uh, in partnership with um, UNOSA, um, we have looked at, at what implementation looks like. And so uh, within that, um, the UK takes its responsibilities in terms of authorising and supervising um, activities in space. For, um, very, it's very important to us. So we have developed a, a strong, we feel, regulatory framework um, and we're here to share our experiences, the approaches that we've, we've learned with engaging with industry, with engaging with um, those looking to license, to support um, those emerging space nations and support their development and implementation of those um, regulatory frameworks. Thank you. I'm taking the example of the RCEP uh, situation that happened recently in France, where a number of satellite operators uh, and others and the space agency said that there's a space debris uh, issue that we should look into, but in the end, what happened was that our SEP said our remit is only about spectrum, and so it's not about space sustainability, even if most parties agree that there is an issue of space sustainability. So that is the thing we need to change and give some teeth uh, and ask for plans, debris removal, you know, sort of data, et cetera, like, like you commented, Andrew, uh, before you provide market access, because before you know it, there won't be a lot of market access to give in certain orbits. I, I, I would also add, Peter, that 
compliance is really hand with hand with uh, accountability. Mm -hmm. So we really need right. to have the account like, right. framework for accountability right. you know, to hold you know actors accountable from their ac for their actions. Yep. Yeah, which Back. is um, easier said than done. Sure. Accountability mm -hmm. to whom? Yep. It could be the nation. It could be at the national level. It could yep. be at the international level. It, it's. I think it's really the stakeholders to decide on what type of accountability would work for outer mm -hmm. space. In the cyber side, we're seeing different levels. We were seeing, uh, you know, local, national legislations. We are also seeing the international framework coming together mm -hmm. on attribution and so on. So it really depends how you uh, how the stakeholders would like to take that on board. Yeah. For me. No, no, I agree, because uh, Rajiv, you mentioned uh, that, you know, one thing is uh, driving towards a more rules-based order. Uh, contra that is we need to look into enforcement. And as we know, the, the legal regime in outer space does not have any dedicated uh, enforcement mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it, it's a discipline under international law, so the, the international law applies, but we don't have that enforcement enshrined in the legal regime on outer space. So then comes the um, accountability question must come from inside, from mm -hmm. the actors themselves. Mm -hmm. We are accountable to ourselves, yeah. in a way. So, so picking up on this theme, there's an excellent question along this, these lines here. Um, the question is, regulators can't act without a mandate and typically only gain a, gain a mandate after a catastrophe. How best to bring the precautionary principle from environmental practice into space so that we don't act after it's too late? Because as Nicholas said, this accountability from within is, <laughs> I think that's where the issue is, right? So if I'm gonna put up indiscriminate number of LEO satellites, yep. uh, don't have a plan for space debris removal, don't have a plan for a disposal orbit mm. that I can sort of put some of these objects in which Maybe my failure rate is more than two to four percent, or even two to four percent is a big deal. Uh, and uh, you know, no plan for a placeholder orbit below 400 kilometers altitude, where you can actually put your satellites first before you take it up, where the risk of failures occur. And if it's all voluntary, I'm going to give it my best shot. It'll be best effort. But you know what? It is what it is. If I create uh, debris for the next 50 years, yeah. So that is the issue. Or if you're not going to follow the uh, the April 2022 uh, mm. ruling from the U.S. on, you know, kinetic um, ASATs, uh, and there's going to be more missile testing as hap or attacks that happened recently in, in, in Russia, from Russia. I mean, there has to be at some point accountability, and accountability comes with consequences, like I drive on a road and I want to protect myself and my fellow uh, uh, fellows on the road, but there is the driving rule, and mm. there's a point-based system. So, for instance, in the U.K., so... <laughs> You know, there, there are just, so you can, you can make a fault, you can have a penalty, and then you get a point, uh, three points or whatever, and the next time, you know, there's greater accountability. But the point is, this notion of self-enforced accountability has its limits, and, and I think we're testing it right now, and uh, if you're gonna have 50,000 satellites in three years' time, and, you know, 100,000 in a few years' time, it'll just be too late to have experimented with, you know, with uh, voluntary mechanisms. But the, uh, but I would say that's, that's where, um, and um, within the UK, so we have the Civil Aviation Authority, and that's where, through the authorization process, they work very closely with the operators, mm. um, and they try and understand the mission as deeply as possible. So they have technical teams within, within the CAA who delve into the collision risk to un try and understand the, uh, the end-of-life disposal plans, to really understand ahead of licensing, ahead of authorizing the mission to, to launch, yeah. that we're confident that they're meeting um, a, a set of international um, best practices, and then post-launch, then there's supervision activities. So there's monitoring uh, their activities through um, health checks or, or ensuring that they f uh, follow rules that have been agreed ahead of time, essentially. Right. So you're saying, before we get market access, we want to see your plan. After that, we want to supervise and monitor. But then is there any enforcement if things go wrong? Well, you would hope that within the authorization process that you're al already authorizing those that you're confident will meet uh, the requirements. Okay. Um, so you don't allow operators on orbit that are necessarily not going to meet your expectations, okay. essentially. That's, that's a good start. That'll be a great start. So, uh, Rajiv, it seems that your suggestion to expand the mandate of RTU has elicited some... Um, uh, a response from the audience, and so the, one of the questions here is: It seems that the the mandate to exp the, the suggestion to expand the mandate of ITU is a good one, 
even if ITU is an imperfect body, what do the other panelists think of this proposal and would they be able to suggest any other alternatives? So, question to the other panelists. I mean, I come from the UN side and Niklas is the same, so for us right. uh, it's more on the multilateral uh, for uh, and, and uh, so uh, I, I, I would pass on that uh, question, Peter, if you don't mind. Okay. I mean, to be clear, our report is probably imperfect, but it's a starting point for, for actions. And not only have we recommended these three big summary recommendations, we actually have a recommendation for any every other forum or organization of influence. So there are detailed recommendations. So. If it's not ITU, it's some better, better idea, great. But then now is the time to put out a report and start to talk around that. It's a starting point. And that's how we've approached it. And we're not fixated on it, it has to be ITU, but it seems like it's, it's uh, one practical body, I think, that had experience with managing spectrum and could be given an existing mandate. Could be somebody else, but as long as there is the mandate. It, it needs to be an independent body. Of and an independent sorts, body. Right? So that's yeah. the key, I yeah. think, in, in, fair, in fair. this. Absolutely right. Okay. Um, changing um, uh, direction then, um, another question here. How should the development of counter space capabilities fit into a rules-based order? I think that's, that's my question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, counter space capabilities, well, it's a really good question. So it, it really goes back to the uh, uh, point about the ASAT capabilities, for instance, or uh, uh, laser dazzling, uh, cyber capabilities of electromagnetic interferences. So all of these capabilities actually led to the formation of the open-ended working group on, on norms, rules, and uh, principles of responsible behaviors because um, states realize that it's no longer about uh, the, the big bang, in a way, of, of, of uh, the activities that are taking place. It could be different type of activities as well as counter space activities that might lead into um, destabilization of outer space and, and uh, insecurity in outer space. Um, so it, it is already factored in and it's already within the discussions among different states uh, on counter space capabilities. Uh, but uh, the, the problem is the, the uh, competition, I think, uh, and, and the arms race that's going on in outer space is really kind of putting most of the efforts that's going on in the multilateral fora a little bit behind. And, and I, 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 I would like us to think the outer space issue on the security side really within the framework of larger security issues that we are facing. Uh, and that everything needs to work together to, to solve one another. We can't just solve the outer space piece without solving the larger uh, issues on the security environment itself. Thank you. Yeah, Peter, yep. yes, yes um, uh, this is important because, I mean, we have the notion of the broader perspective of space security, uh, which uh, encompasses uh, safety, security, and sustainability. And uh, you know, Peter, because you were part of it, the EEG, EGG report on the TCBMs, Transparency and Confidence Building Measures in Outer Space Activities, that came 2013, and which was, in a way, if I may use that word, revolutionary, because it came with a new concept, a new innovation that we all we need to look into the safety and sustainability in order also to address security and vice versa. That doesn't mean that we are, we have, we, we sh should, or I would say we should, we shouldn't, but to blur the way that the, the system is working. So COOPUS is dealing with certain mandated areas, and then we have the security dimension being addressed in other fora. That, that should continue. We should be careful in how we relate to security in COOPUS and safety and sustainability in the security uh, domain. But we need to be aware that we are dealing with a dual use environment yeah. here. And we need to be aware that whatever is decided in security context also will have effects on the safety and sustainability and vice versa. So we need to be aware of that. So I, I think that's really, really important because 
in the discussions, really, what we're seeing in Corpus and the uh, Paros and OEWG forum, it, it comes to the points on dual use or dual purpose related work. So space debris is part of that, for instance. RPO activities that are, are another example of that. Um, and I understand the siloed approach that we are following within the United Nations, and that needs to be protected. But we need to find ways of really, if it is about space debris, what is it about space debris that needs to be discussed within the security forum, which is the intentional deliberate use, perhaps? And what is it about space debris that needs to be discussed within the peaceful uses and, and sustainability forum? That di differentiation really needs to be made in a clear way. Yeah, and perhaps I was just following, um, following this thread, um, there's a question here about um, w w the, the chance that um, a rules-based order being subverted by gray zone activities. Um, and uh, is, is, there, is there a risk that um, engaging in these kinds of activities may push these gray zone activities further underground and make them more difficult to identify and, um, and, and track? I don't know if that's a question for you, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so on the gray zone activities, I mean, it's, it's an important and interesting question because they are the type of activities that are under the threshold of warfare. So uh, by, by the definition, it's really hard to apply the, the existing international uh, legal instruments into these type of activities. But they are lowering also the threshold, in a way, of, of conflict, too. Um, so the, the, there needs to be really a more discussion on, on these type of operations that are taking place that are under the threshold of conflict. But, but should be viewed as you know, irresponsible behavior, probably. I, I think it would really fit into the, the uh, norms, rules, and you know, principles framework uh, to look at the, 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 this uh, side of the issue. Um, and, and we need to understand that just because something is not legally you know, made or there's no legal agreement on that, it does not mean that countries should follow that action. Uh, just because there's no legal agreement doesn't mean that you should continue, you know, irresponsibly of, of, of your actions. So I think uh, disinformation campaigns along with um, gray zone activities, uh, would, would hybrid activities would, would fit into that framework. Coming back then to lessons that can be learned from other domains, um, uh, are there are there other um, domains that have um, lessons to, to offer um, based on principles from economics or, or other disciplines that we could apply? Speed. <laughs> you know, uh, I think is one issue. I think you know, the, the issue here is that this was less of a problem in the past because there were not that many space players, right? So now there's a greater probability of a bad actor because of mega constellations, the issue isn't constellations, the issue is mega constellations, so there's a higher risk of negative impact. I think just uh, a few principles uh, reaffirm space as a common province of humankind. That's a, that's a, that's a good lesson. Start to enforce this principle. Uh, another is peaceful use of outer space. Uh, no more ASAT testing, uh, no more clandestine you know, proximity operations. Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty regarding harmful interference, need standards and coordination mechanisms for crisis management under new and binding regulations. And I think climate change is, is the big lesson here, right? You want net zero on Earth, you're not going to get it if there's no net zero in space. Okay, thank you. So our time is catching up with us. Um, we only have um, a few minutes left, so I'd like to, to wrap up by um, inviting all of the panelists to Give us your key takeaway message in terms of what you think is the most important or most urgent thing that we should do to strengthen the rules-based order in outer space. And I'll start at the far end of the um, podium and work this way. Okay, thank you. So I don't have time to think of my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as I said, uh, we have a rules-based order already. It's now a matter of looking into how national implementation of the obligations and rights under that order must be taken forward. 
because as, as has been said by other Rajiv in particular, that we don't have much time, we need to take action, but it always boils down to the national level. So that is my, my tip, implementation, but look at it structurally. Right, implementation at national level, and that's where you also get the teeth as well, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Beza? Uh, I'm gonna follow up with Rajiv said on climate, I think, uh, issues, because uh, climate emergency is really interesting. It just like pushed up the, the, the climate agenda really forward. So maybe we should be actually thinking about emergency in outer space and how can we as, as a community push that forward, acknowledge, for instance, uh, and perhaps declare that humanity is in, in an under emergency and that what type of priorities and actions that needs to be tackled uh, within that emergency. It's not only the states, it's also the private sector perhaps to, to, to put, put up policies around you know, what they would do to tackle uh, such emergency, what they would do to mitigate the risks around that emergency. Perhaps we need to think about some target points as well. In the climate emergency community, there, were, there are target points. Can we come up with those type of uh, you know, points of, of you know, where, where should we be going or where should we be not going? Um, the first session or the second session was interesting, interesting in that regard. They discussed about modeling and modeling approaches. We really need database, evidence-based evidence uh, notions in that for, 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 uh, uh, for targets. So I, I, would, I would just say that. Thank you. I love the comment. So act now to get things right for future generations. The solution is three-pronged, national, as we've said, multilateral, and global, where there is an expanded mandate for some agency that is neutral. Thank you. I think I'd, I'd follow on from the, the evidence-based um, element. So we, we need to know what environment we're targeting. What, what, where are we going in terms of what are the long-term evolution of the environment so we can really understand and develop uh, the guidelines and the operational practices and the technologies that, that mean that we can eventually get to that, that point. Um, so I, I would say funding fundamental research into the environment would be the key thing. Mm. So acting responsibly uh, requires cooperation. So it, it's, it's between all the actors and all the levels and also connecting the dots from other areas so that we can tap on, on the lessons learned from what we do in climate change or the green and, and digital transition, what, what we can learn and, and how we can use that for uh, ensuring sustainable uh, use of outer space. And that's really something that uh, the cooperation element and, and talking to everyone is what we need in, in navigating that sort of difficult uh, and, and complex uh, regulatory framework and, and really to make the connection between the international level and, and the national level. Thank you. Well, thank you for being so succinct with your key takeaways. Well, there you have it, the key takeaways from our panelists and they've um, kept very well to their time. So this brings us to the end of this panel. Um, thank you very much to all of you who contributed questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through to all of them. I tried to combine uh, as many as I could but uh, let us uh, please join me in giving our panelists a round of applause. Thank you.